Welcome colleagues, for those of you who are joining us online and for those who have joined us live at International House. Um, it's most delightful to welcome you. I am Marcia Meskimen, I'm the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies. For those who are joining online, if I can um, just give you a little bit of housekeeping to say that there you will find at the bottom of your webinar page, a Q&A and a chat function. Both of these will be monitored throughout the, um, uh, the talk today. So please feel free to either make comments or ask questions in either of those two. And we'll make sure that we feed them in as and when, um, probably not during the conversation today, but at the end of the seminar. Um, but we will make sure that you have an opportunity to be involved. Um, at, if at any point you have to tune in or tune out of the webinar, don't worry about that either. It will not interrupt anything in the room. So please be aware that we are recording the talk but we are not going to record any elements of the dialogue or conversation after. We don't hold anybody's GDPR, we don't hold anybody's um, uh, data in any way on file or recorded or, or um, distributed in any way. So without any further ado then, having made those kind of housekeeping comments, it's my great pleasure to welcome Daniel Carney, who is an IAS residential fellow. So he is joining us for a month period of time and he's been here now for two weeks of that month, three weeks of that month. Time flies, actually, time flies. Um, Daniel is an associate professor of economics at Ohio University at Athens, Ohio, and he is a specialist in energy and environmental policy. Now, we are really delighted to have this conversation uh, today, precisely because this gives us an international and an interdisciplinary insight into some of the key and pressing challenges that we all face in um, the global economy and in the global uh, climate um, uh, of, of the day. Where clearly um, Loughborough is considering climate change and net zero to be part of its um, research strategic themes. But often when we talk about that in this university, we are talking about that um, from the idea of um, looking at alternative fuels, we look at questions of the built environment, we look at questions of in, in, um, environmental science, we look at human geography, but we don't ask ourselves quite as many uh, things I would suggest about the um, economic drivers policy. And actually this conversation, this dialogue has the potential to open up some of that dynamic in looking at climate change and net zero. And I'm really delighted that we're actually going to be able to do that by having an IAS um, residential fellow who has real expertise in this, a, a primary um, uh, driver on uh, these questions from a US perspective, but who has now recently been also exploring these in relation to European policy. So we're gonna be able to have an interdisciplinary and an international conversation about this. And with that said, it is a great, great pleasure to welcome you, Daniel, and please take the floor. Yes, great, thank you very much. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, here at IS. So talk today is gonna to be titled Understanding uh, 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 carbon leakage from climate policy. Again, I'm uh, Professor Carney from Ohio University, um, and let's get started. So some preliminaries first. Again, thank you to IES. Thank you to Marcia. Thank you to all the staff for um, helping open my visit and this talk, and so I appreciate all of your work. I'd also like to thank the Business School and Economics Group for sponsoring my time here, essentially um, giving me a place to uh, hang out with other colleagues. I see some other colleagues in the room here. So thank you to the Business School and Economics Group as well. Some other uh, housekeeping. Uh, there's a graduate student workshop tomorrow, which I'm doing uh, at this location at the International House. So uh, the top uh, title of that is uh, Causal Identification in Economics um, with an application to the European Carbon Market. So similar themes, similar themes. All right, some other preliminaries. Um, uh, this is a talk that's adapted from some uh, uh, very uh, modeling oriented uh, scholarly work with some co-authors that I'm doing. Uh, so Professor Pullerton from the University of Illinois and Professor Bayless from UC, University of California, uh, uh, Santa Barbara. And the title of that paper is The Model of the Model, Unpacking CGE Results on Leakage from Climate Policy. That wasn't the talk, uh, the, uh, the talk that I wanted to today. I wanted to give it a more general, a little more overview, but I'm gonna pull on some themes from that, kind of strip away some of the technical modeling and think about the kind of bigger picture and some more uh, general takeaways. So uh, there's a technical paper that is behind all of this with all of the math and all of the technical pieces, but we're gonna abstract from that for today. So I hope that's okay. But that is uh, something that I'm working on. If you want to follow up with me on that particular piece of research, uh, feel free to do so. Okay, so some introduction. 
Um, as Marcia said, I was preparing this talk. I also was learning about kind of how the Europe and the UK are addressing this uh, carbon leakage policy. And in fact, very timely. So this is from September 29th of this year, from the European Commission. The uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, starts to apply its transitional phase. Okay, so what does that mean? That actually started on October 1st, so this month. So like three weeks ago, right when I got here. So very timely. What is that? So the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism is the EU's landmark tool to fight carbon leakage, their term. Right, so I added the emphasis, but they use the word carbon leakage in the opening statement of that press release. It will equalize the price of carbon between domestic products and imports. And so this is kind of the big thing. This will ensure that the EU's climate policies are not undermined by production relocating to countries with less ambitious green standards or by the replacement of EU products by more carbon intensive imports. So these are kind of the themes behind what carbon leakage is. Somehow there's kind of this analogy. Uh, if you're kind of squeezing a balloon in one place, the kind of balloon expands in another place, right? So that's kind of the anal one analogy you might use here. And so this is the kind of technical tools that the EU is thinking about using. Okay. Uh, it tends to be sector specific. So again, from, the, from this press release, okay. In this transitional phase, the uh, carbon border just mechanism will apply only to cement, iron and steel, aluminum, as you say here, okay, uh, fertilizers, electricity, and hydrogen. Uh, EU, um, the EU importers of these goods will have to essentially report their greenhouse gas emissions, okay, that are from these products. I've added, I've emphasized that they're currently not going to be paid or taxed at a financial incentive, right? So there's no actual tax right now, they're just doing the reporting mechanism, getting the importers used to essentially accounting for the carbon of the imports, okay? Um, and then the target date is 2026 to actually do the financial adjustment, which is essentially equivalent to a tax or a tariff on those imported goods relative to their carbon content. So right now they're in kind of the transition phase, they're kind of building the database, they're kind of getting all of the importers used to reporting their carbon emissions, and then the current target is 2026 for this implementation, okay? So again, can be quite relevant, quite relevant for trade policy. And um, so the UK ETS, so um, the UK is not part of the EU ETS anymore, they have their own policy. Um, but as you can see, there's also discussions about how to do these um, carbon border, they call the tax in this Reuters article. Um, and so the EU calls it a, a fine, uh, adjustment mechanism, but they're essentially the same thing. So quite relevant, right? We see in the very first line of that um, European Commission press release, we see the term carbon leakage. So clearly something that's on the mind, clearly something that's current policy discussions, and we're going to think more about that. Okay, so that's kind of the background um, setup. Uh, just as a quick note, I'll, um, uh, dirt, we'll have uh, about 10, 15, 10, 10, 15 minutes at the end for uh, discussion. But if there's any clarifying questions that we can have along the way, if you know, you need a term clarified just to keep everybody uh, together, uh, you know, uh, raise your hand and I'll kind of do that clarifying, but we'll, we'll kind of wait for more substantive questions to the end. That sound good to everybody? All right. Okay, so carbon leakage. What's the main concern? The main concern is that any unilateral climate policy, so that is, uh, let's say, EU is doing their own policy or the US is doing their own policy or the UK is doing their own policy, right, is this carbon leakage problem, okay? And it's defined as essentially the increase in emissions in uncovered regions, countries, or sectors divided by the reduction in the covered region or sectors or countries, however you want, depending on what the context is, okay? So uh, in the European Union, there's both um, leakage, to my understanding, you know, to outside the EU, but also there are covered and uncovered sectors within the EU. And you can think about leakage between those sectors as well. So there's kind of multiple dimensional problems here, right? Covered and uncovered sectors, uh, covered, covered countries and uncovered countries, or however we want to think about the relevant piece. So just an example of, to be clear about what we're talking about in terms of numbers. What's an example? I made up some numbers here. 100 million metric tons of reduction of carbon from the EU ETS, okay? Um, let's say there's a 25 uh, million metric ton increase elsewhere, okay? 
Now, importantly, it has to be causally identified, right? We have to make sure there's not just correlations and increases elsewhere, but actual causation. We will completely abstract from identifying causality here. Okay, we'll just assume that you can causally identify this. Very important distinction, right? Let's say China's growing a lot, China's increasing their emissions. That's not sufficient to say there's leakage, right? You need to know the actual cause from your policy to their emissions. We are not covering that in this talk, in this talk okay? Let's just assume we can do that. Um, we would say in this case, we have a 25% leakage rate, okay? But that's still a net decrease of 75 million metric tons. So leakage does not necessarily mean an increase, it's just an increase elsewhere as a cause of your policy relative to their baseline, okay? So there's a lot of kind of counterfactuals going on in the background. Does that make sense, everybody? We're on board? Okay. So that's the, so we're gonna say leakage rates and we're kind of, we're not gonna so much talk about kind of net decreases in the way we're thinking about it right now. Okay, so how big are these effects? Um, so there are a recent IMF working paper. So for the EU and UK, their kind of leakage rate is about 15% is what the estimate they have from the IMF, right? So, you know, this would be in the example four, a 15 million ton, million metric ton increase elsewhere. Okay. Um, and why is this true? Well, the EU and UK is relatively big, okay, which means a small percentage reduction in emissions in the EU and UK is actually a large amount. So the, the, the denominator of your leakage rate is large, right? So the denominator term is big. And so the bigger the denominator term, the smaller your leakage rate gets. Okay. So that's kind of a uh, kind of a what we're talking about. It's kind of 15% uh, effect. Okay, and why is this? Of course, because I'm trying to reduce emissions, but if other people increase emissions, then, and it doesn't really matter where the emissions come from, then that's kind of a problem, potentially a problem, right? Um, so there is a global pollutant. This is distinct from kind of um, regional or local pollutants. So I'm not sure how familiar you guys are, but um, different pollutants have different scales in which they impact populations or uh, the environment. So you might imagine in the United States, for instance, they had a very famous policy to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions, which was a regional policy that basically was kind of impacting one state to another, where you can kind of say emissions here would go from one county to another, maybe one country in the EU to another country within the EU, right? Those would be regional. You can also have local pollutants where kind of I burn fossil fuels and I get some particulate matter, some unburned carbon, and that's gonna impact the local population in a very kind of concentrated way. So depending on your pollution problem, the scale of your effect matters, right? Here it's a global effect, so it really matters what the total change is, but in other contexts, it may only impact what your local changes. So it kind of depends on the setting in general for pollution, right? Um, in general, it's impossible to cover all carbon emissions um, almost by, by construct, right? Um, there's gonna, always gonna be some sector that doesn't quite get under the policy just because of how this works, right? And so, Kind of best estimates you can get 80 or 90 percent of emissions covered from any given policy a tax a cap and trade a a uh, a standard so there's all kinds of different mechanisms to reduce emissions we will also abstract from that in this talk there's whole talks we can have about should you use a cap and trade policy or a carbon tax or or a, a mandate or a technology specific piece right there's all kinds of different ways to do it there's lots of Fabulous and interesting questions we can talk about, right? Um, but we'll abstract from that as well. We'll just stipulate that there is this reduction from some mechanism. In the EU, they do generally do a cap and trade. Other places, they do more taxes, right? Or in the United States, we really like mandates, particularly technology mandates. Um, so well-covered policies are never going to cover everything. Other important issues that we will um, talk about during this talk is um, kind of the sector-specific distributional effects. And that's one of the things that we saw from the press release, right? We had those very industry-specific lists, cement, fertilizer, aluminum, right? Uh, and so these very specific kind of trade-intensive sectors, right? So we see this kind of very targeted kind of thinking about how is this climate policy going to impact my trade and in sense have distributional effects on those trade um, those trade uh, exposed, trade exposed sectors, right? 
And we'll come back to this uh, later in the talk with an analogy to kind of like free trade liberalization around the year 2000, especially with the US and China. We'll talk about kind of how distributional effects work there. So it's kind of an analogy I want you to think about in the background. So sector specific effects saw from the carbon border adjustment mechanism press release. And then we also have uh, low income households, important distributional factor. So low income households tend to spend more of their income on energy. Energy will increase in relative price relative to, to other goods and services um, from essentially climate policy. And so how do distributional effects there? We won't have as much to say on the low income households, but it's something important to keep in the back of your mind as well. All right. Continuing. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how these leakage effects are measured. Okay, uh, most of the CGE literature finds a leakage rate about 10 to 20 percent, which is what kind of we talked about before. CGE is just called the black box of a computer. Technically, it stands for computable general equilibrium model. Don't worry about that. When you see CGE, think black box computer. You throw a bunch of equations in there, and you get a number out of the, of the, out of the box, right? So very clever people have spent a lot of time building very complex models. Um, and what you get is this number, this leakage rate. Okay. So some examples of these uh, leakage rates. So in the early 2000s, we had kind of simpler, they're still very complicated, but simpler ones. Uh, so Paul Tsev had this uh, uh, leakage calculation from the Kyoto Protocol, which was 1999, and he estimated the leakage rate from that would be 10%. Okay. Babaker also did Kyoto Protocol one, and he and he had very different assumptions, right? And he had a leakage rate of 130 percent. If you do your math right, that means that's an increase in total emissions in the world from the policy, right? Uh, that seemed maybe uh, you can you can generate that in these models. Probably not realistic in most settings, but it's possible to do. Okay. Um, Elliot et al. did another kind of global wide policy analysis. We'll return to that one later, and they got 20%. So it's very close to the EU ETS 15%. And then Guler and Hasted, they have an American centric one. So think about reducing emissions from electricity sector in the US. That's basically what the discussion is in the US, just kind of tax emissions from electricity because we can change to wind and solar, right? Um, and so they have a very small leakage effect. And we'll talk about why that is later. Right, so it really depends on the setting in which you want to measure the effects. Right, so what's your exact policy can range a lot. Right, so kind of for kind of EU scale, we're getting these like 10, 15, 20% rates. Um, depending on the setting, you can get much smaller or much larger rates. So it's it depends on the exact policy analysis you're looking at. Some of the goals from the remainder of this talk um, is kind of understanding where this leakage is coming from. Like, why is it happening? So clearly the EU is saying, we think this is the problem. We think we have a solution for it, but why is it happening? And why is it happening is important for what you can do about it, okay? Because, and we'll talk about, there are potentially some ways you can and some ways you cannot control leakage. So we'll think about those different pieces. And how big are these different mechanisms, okay? We're gonna identify seven in this talk, okay? Uh, there are potentially eight, depending on how you think about it. We're, we're going to identify seven specific effects. Okay. And uh, yeah, we'll think about the relative sizes. Think about the relative sizes. As a small preview, turns out the largest leakage effect, um, my initial, our initial analysis suggests that you can't really do much about that one. Right? Just kind of has, it exists by the function of markets in the economy. And you can't really directly impact it. And border carbon adjustments don't quite do that either. And we'll talk about why. So, some pessimistic news, but perhaps just some optimistic news later as well. Okay. So I think that's where we are in the introduction. Yes. Okay. Have a sip of water and then we'll continue. Okay. So we're going to go through the mechanisms. Understanding our leakage mechanisms. Okay. So this is the section that's kind of borrowed from the technical paper. Okay. Well, I've tried to strip out all of the stuff. So essentially we'll just have two, two sectors. We're gonna talk about trading off two sectors, right? So covered and uncovered. So we'll call Y is the covered, X is uncovered. Um, you can think of the covered sector in the US context as being electricity sector. You can think of Y uh, in the EU as being EU and X being everything else. So it really just depends on what context you wanna apply this model to. And it's really nice because we can apply the same model to a US specific question or a global question, right? 
and there's some trade-offs as well. So again, you can think of X and Y as two countries or two regions or two sectors within the same country, depending on exactly what type of analysis you want to do. So X is going to be uh, uncovered. Think of this as rest of the economy, rest of the world. Y is the covered. Think of this as the energy intensive sector, EUETS, electric power in the US, whatever the particular context is. We're going to have a very simple structure. Um, each of uh, the covered and uncovered areas are going to just have two inputs. They're going to have clean inputs. Let's call that capital and labor. We're just going to shove, shove those all together, all the clean stuff, and on all the dirty stuff. We'll call that fuel. Right? So you need some carbon fuel, I need some clean inputs. You just combine those together and you get some emissions. Okay. And we'll have a fuel sector as well. We'll come back to that later. So uh, fuel is uh, produced using some resources as well. Okay. Any questions about the setup? So pretty, pretty simple setup. Turns out we can derive a lot of stuff from this very simple setup, which is quite nice. Okay, that's what the paper looks like, but we're not doing that one. We're doing this one. Okay, there we are. Um, so the paper, that's a simple equation from the paper, uh, but we will just use letters. Okay, we'll use these letters. Okay, so we solved the basic model and it has three leakage effects. Okay, so your leakage rate is going to be kind of the sum of these three effects, which is very nice. Turns out it's very nice and linear. Um, the first one is the terms of trade effect. This is the one that kind of jumps to most people's minds. Essentially, if the relative price of the stuff in your region goes up, that means the relative price of stuff outside the covered region goes down, right? So this would be cheaper imports, right? Or cheaper other goods. And so people are going to shift their purchases to the cheaper stuff. That's exactly what the carbon border adjustment policy is supposed to account for, right? And we're supposed to equalize prices based on the carbon inputs, right? So the terms of trade effect is a positive leakage effect. It essentially comes from the fact that demand shifts towards goods that are not subject to the policy or subject to a lower rate of the policy. Okay. So that's the one that comes to always mind, right? So in the US, it would be something like we're concerned about cheaper imports of Chinese steel, right? That would be kind of the classic US one, right? So we're, we're going to shut down all the steel plants in the United States, we're going to import Chinese steel. But we haven't done anything because the global emissions are the, the same, or potentially even more. Right, that goes to the back to the uh, Bobaker paper, where you could theoretically have positive leakage rates. So, if the U.S. had very efficient steel producers and China had very inefficient steel producers, in theory, you could actually increase emissions. Right? Turns out that usually doesn't happen, but it's possible. So, very first one, in terms of trade effect, the uh, um, uh, car uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism is kind of meant to address that one. All right, that's the first effect. Second effect, abatement and resource effect. This one is actually the one that um, my colleagues and I identified in a separate paper. Uh, so we had, were one of the first people to identify this one. So essentially, firms in the covered sector um, or covered region or covered country need resources to reduce their pollution. So when you drive around, you see a bunch of windows and you see a bunch of solar stuff. And you see a bunch of fuel-efficient cars or EVs. Now. Those things require resources. They require capital and labor to make them. If you take capital and labor to make them, it means there's less capital and labor to do other things, and particularly other things that are not covered, right? So what does it mean? You have to take resources from somewhere, bring them into the covered sector, which means there are fewer resources to produce other things. That's a negative effect, right? And what, another way to think about it in a market is, if you need a bunch of capital to build windmills, you're bidding up the price of capital that other people then don't want to buy capital, right? So we uh, look at that. And then there's this one we'll return, uh, we'll return to a little more important one later. It's called the fuel resource effect. Similarly, um, it's a positive leakage term, okay? Essentially, the covered sector is reducing their demand for carbon fuels. This frees up some resources the other way, and then they get to, the uncovered sector get to use more resources. So. Uh, two and three are about movement, essentially, of capital around. One of them reduces and one of them uh, increases. And those are those you get out of the basic model very nice and cleanly. Number one, though, the terms of trade effect, that's the thing that most people think of when they think of carbon leakage. That's explicitly the one that the uh, EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, that's the term, uh, is meant to uh, directly focus. Okay, so that's three. We're doing the math. We got four more to go, four more to go. All right, so the four model variants will have something called policy normalization effect, pure income effect, input output effect, and fuel price effect. The first two I'll go through relatively quickly and we'll spend some more time on the latter two. So the, the first two are a little bit um, a little bit niche modeling pieces. 
Um, the last two are kind of uh, kind of more meat and potatoes. Tips. Okay, and then eventually we combine them all into a big model. Okay, policy normalization effect. Essentially, imagine if you could convince uh, China to increase their uh, their uh, price of carbon while the EU ETS was tightening its policy. Right? So the EU had these phases, and imagine between the phases of the EU ETS, they you convinced China to increase its price also. So we went from phase two to phase three. You said, oh, China, can you can you bump up your price of your carbon emissions at the same time? And in fact, you think about this, essentially we keep the relative price of carbon emissions stable, right, between the two places. So you're kind of moving them both at the same time. If you don't, essentially the price gets wider between the two. And the price getting wider between the two means there's going to be more leakage. So this is just a relative pricing story. For those of you that are economically inclined, relative prices matter a lot. And so this is a relative prices story about carbon emissions due to policy, right? Um, maybe if you don't like the China, non-China, you can think of um, covered and uncovered sectors within the EU or the UK, UK. So the policymaker in those contexts can actually directly control essentially the tax rate, effective tax rate on the other sectors. And you can choose to increase that or not increase that. If you don't increase that, right, the difference gets bigger. When the difference gets bigger, there's more incentive for leakage. If the difference kind of moves together, there's less incentive for leakage. So this is a kind of a negative leakage effect in the way that the policy is modeled. Okay, another one, pure income effect. If you have a tax, carbon tax, or if you have a cap and trade policy with um, auction, which is kind of the new way that the EU is going, you have a bunch of money, okay, from that, right? The question is, what do you do with that money? Um, and in kind of standard, um, kind of standard economic analysis, you kind of just give the money back to the consumers. In, the, in kind of the real world, uh, governments like to spend money, right? When they have money, they're like, oh, I get more money on margin. Um, and so if the government keeps some of that money and essentially spends it on clean goods, there's less money to buy dirty goods outside the government, right? And so that's going to reduce leakage, right? So if the government increases their spending on clean goods with this revenue, it's going to essentially use more resources. These resources are not going to be available for dirty emissions, right? And so it's going to drive down leakage. So it kind of matters what you do with the revenue in some sense. A lot of economic models abstract from this, and they just call it a lump sum. When you lump sum rebate, essentially nothing changes on the margin. For those of you that like economics, you understand what that means, right? Um, but essentially, what the government does matters. In the economic models, you get to control that. In the real world, you don't have as much control about that from an economist's point of view. Okay, those are both negative effects. Here's a big negative effect. So this is kind of uh, one of the more meat and potatoes. What if the output from your covered sector, so in the EU or in the US context, is called that electricity? So we're, we're reducing the electricity intensity of, or sorry, carbon intensity of emissions from the electricity sector in the US. But other sectors use electricity to make a whole bunch of stuff. So this is a negative leakage effect. Essentially, the price of electricity has to go up because their costs are going up. That means the electricity that's being used by the uncovered sector has to go up as well. What this is essentially doing is transmitting the carbon tax through the electricity to the uncovered sector because they have to use the electricity. Okay, um, And so that's the way to think about it. So essentially, you have the, the, the covered area, and it's transmitting through its output the price to the other sector before it actually gets sold back to you and me. Okay, so this is called an input output effect. Um, the intermediate goods in trade, you can think about EU exports a bunch of clean uh, goods that are then embedded in the goods that are that use that as an in, as an input outside of the EU or the, uh, the UK. So this is a really important one. You know, but, um, yeah. that's before electricity is decarbonized, I guess. So the in the model, the firms actually get to make their electricity less uh, um, less carbon intensive. So there are both substitution effects where they're kind of cleaner per unit and also level effects as well. So the modeling has both of those included. Uh, the negative effect comes from the increase in the tax on the electricity, isn't it? Uh, yes. So the negative, it's negative leakage effect, right? So we're increasing the tax on electricity that is driving up the prices of electricity that then is used in the 
to make, I don't know, something else, right? Paper, right? That then paper has to get more expensive so the consumption of paper goes down, right? So that's less leakage. Yeah. But again, that's uh, non decarbonized electricity. Correct. If, if electricity were fully decarbonized, it would have no impact. Yeah. yeah. So at, at the point where we have fully decarbonized that sector that produces that intermediate good, that yeah. impact goes away. That's true. Um, yes, that's right. That's right. Um, but to the extent that, uh, yes, if you were fully decarbonized, then this effect wouldn't matter. Well, it's a little weird to say because would you increase a carbon tax or add more policies to a sector that was already fully decarbonized? I'm not quite sure. Got to think about it, right? Yeah. So it's unclear what the policy change would be in that situation because we're already decarbonized. I don't need to do anything. So then it wouldn't have any impact on leakage because I'm not doing any more reductions. So it's kind of a I'm not quite sure the right way to think about that question. That's interesting. That's question. The problem, the, the yeah. Dynamics of the yes. Yes. So um, there are all kinds of in the in the black box model, black box models, they have all kinds of intertemporal problems and dozens and dozens of sectors and really fine details. In order to make this tractable, we have to simplify a lot of stuff, right? So we're kind of abstracted away from a lot of the intertemporal issues and transition dynamics and all these other important things. So there's many important things. These are just some of the issues to think about. But yes, dynamics would be an important piece. Like at what point do you start, for example, if it's almost fully decarbonized, you start kind of like, rolling back your carbon tax to make it less onerous so you have less leakage that's possible All right so definitely a lot of things to think about any other questions about the input output effect this is a very important one all right finally we talked about the fuel sector we're coming back to the fuel sector so originally the fuel sector just used some resources like machines to make fuel but what if the fuel sector had a natural resource requirement which is pretty realistic right it turns out you get a really you get a positive leakage effect. Um, so what happens in the covered area? The uh, carbon tax or policy essentially lowers the equilibrium price of fuel in that area, right? So the demand for carbon fuel reduces, but there's a worldwide carbon fuel market. So does that mean equilibrium price has to fall? In the uncovered regions, what do they see? They just see the price goes down. So what happens when the price goes down? All is equal consumption goes up, right? So the uncovered area or place where the policy isn't changing or is less stringent, right? What they see is, oh, for a reason, the price of gasoline has gone down. I haven't done anything, but it's gone down for me, right? So I'm going to then use more fuel that creates more emissions in the uncovered area and therefore there's more leakage, right? So this is a, a kind of a, market in, um, interdependent market effect, right? There's kind of what the global price of oil, demand for oil from the EU and UK falls, world price of oil, all is equal, right? We're abstracting from a bunch of other things going on. World price of oil falls. People outside the UK and EU are like, price of oil goes down. I'll go drive my car some more, right? So emissions go up and leakage goes up. That's a positive effect. So those are our seven effects. And then if you throw them all together in a model, you actually get this also this, inter this um, interaction term. It turns out that some of the effects are nonlinear, and so you get this kind of interaction that floats around in the background. So there's actually like seven or eight, depending on how you have to count. Okay. So all these terms are uh, we strived up, and this extra effect. All right. How are we doing? We're doing good. Okay. So how big are these? How, how, how big are these important pieces? Right. So what do we do? Uh, we worked with uh, a couple of different uh, CG teams. Uh, one is the SimEarth Sim team with Elliott et al. papers and the Goulder and Halfstead paper, which is the American one. Okay. And we try to take and we try to fit their values from their model into our model. So they have a bunch of model values that they use, and we're trying to kind of shoehorn them into our model. And we can then decompose their one number. Remember, they report like 15% or 20%. The question is how much comes from each of the seven things I just described? That's an important question if you're thinking about how to interface with policy, right? Well, here's my preliminary results. Looks like this. Okay, at the bottom is the leakage rate that, they're, that, that their one number gives. So in the Gulen Halfstead, they have that 0 0.70 leakage rate. Okay, so that you, sorry, the US policy is generating, that's their leakage rate. 
And in the similar simula simulation that we're looking at, the leakage rate is 3.58%. Okay, we're just picking one. There's lots of different ones you could do. The sum of our total leakage is right here. So when we apply their values to our model, it's not going to fit perfectly because we're abstracting away from many things that they're doing. We get 0 0.52, which is pretty good, and 4.82, which is also, I think, pretty good considering we have to abstract away from a lot of stuff. But then what's great is we can use our equations. I showed you the one equation. We have many more equations in the paper. If you want to follow up with those, we can, right? And we can then plug their primary values into our equations and we can see where the leakage is coming from. So remember, the black box can only give you the big number down here at the bottom. We can give you all of the sub numbers, okay? So for instance, in the SimEarth model, the fuel price effect is a positive 9% leakage rate. Uh, effect on leakage, right? 9%. So uh, Gould and Hasta doesn't have that because they don't have a worldwide fuel market in their model. In terms of trade effect, another positive effect, so 3.32 uh, in terms of trade effect. So that says um, from the terms of trade effect alone, there's a 3.32 percentage leakage rate from that term alone, okay? Gould and Hasta is much smaller in that particular setting. Fuel resource effect, again, fuel takes resources. So the subtotal, if you just looked at the positive effects would be 13% here and 2.72% here. But remember, not all our effects are positive. Some of them are negative. So policy normalization effect, it's a negative effect, okay? Again, that's a little more inside baseball one. You notice there's no pure income effect. Turns out none of the models have it, so they kind of dropped it from the table. A big resource effect, this is the one that my co-author has identified. It's decent size, it's about the same size as this fuel effect here, the smaller fuel effect. Input output effect, pretty large negative number, relatively speaking. And notice that this number here is kind of on the same scale as like this number here. And this number here is somewhat on the same scale as this number here. So the input output effect is somewhat on the same scale as the terms of trade effect in terms of a negative effect. And so here, here's our in interaction effect here. And so these are the subtotals for negative. And if you sum the positive and the negative, you get the total together, independent rounding, of course. Okay. So that's how you read these tables. So we can give some sense. This is the one that the uh, terms of trade effect is the one that, again, directly the carbon border adjustment mechanism is meant to target. But if we look at it in kind of global models, which the EU is in included in the global model, you get this, there's a term that's much bigger. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of numbers here. Any any questions from the audience to clarify? Then yeah. can you just explain again why a border adjustment would not protect the fuel price effect. Um so there's gonna be a general equilibrium effects in the background. A it's gonna affect it's going to affect this interaction term slightly, but as the way we identify it, it can't impact this directly. This is isolated just from the equilibrium uh, fuel price to the extent that there is going to be a change in the compos essentially the composition due to border carbon or carbon border adjustment mechanism. Then it could change that, but we've kind of isolated them separately. That I think would go. Doesn't it yeah. depend a bit on what exactly this border adjustment targets? Yeah, for sure. Targets Product prices. Yep. So the final prices. Yep. And this effect would be covered. Is that correct? Um, the I think the way we've identified it, what would happen is it would change the composition, and that changing composition is going to be, um, it would be a in the way it would show up in this model, it would be a smaller negative interaction effect. But we can talk about that offline because that's a little more technical. Yeah. All right. So. Some discussion and conclusion since we're right on schedule. Okay, so um, we have uh, this carbon border adjustment mechanism. It addresses this terms of trade effect directly. That's explicitly stated. That's what it's meant to target. That's the second largest positive leakage effect. So that is important. Uh, well, we'll talk about it offline uh, in terms of can the carbon border adjustment mechanism, I think the way we've defined it, cannot directly adjust uh, directly address the fuel price effect which is the largest um, piece. So the way we defined it, there may be some, some uh, important theoretical ways about, is that the right definition? But the way we currently defined it, it cannot, okay? Um, so it cannot address that, that largest leakage effect directly. 
Um, one concern one might think about is if you have these uh, carbon border different mechanisms, this may spark reciprocal tariffs, especially in the EU setting, which would, might limit this input output effect, right? So remember the input output effect is transmitting the kind of the carbon price through the traded goods. And so if you're limiting this trade, this trading goods, then you might limit this input output effect as you can't essentially transmit low carbon European goods to outside of Europe, right? That's possible. May, there's a big May here. I'm not saying it will, say May. And that's the largest independent negative leakage effect. And in general, one might want to think about how does a government substitute between the choice of a carbon border adjustment mechanism and its costs and its benefits versus the costs and benefits of payments or other incentives to have a larger coalition, right? So on the margin, do you want to try and add more countries or do you want to try and limit leakage through carbon border adjustment mechanisms? And that's a trade-off in terms of time, resources, political capital, a lot of things to think about, All right? So what's the trade-off on that margin as well? Distributional effects, very important to consider. We don't explicitly do this here, but we can see the theme, right? The theme going through. We have these uh, kind of concentrated versus diffuse impacts, okay? There's so, we have the listing of the sectors. Clearly there's a concern about concentrated impacts in terms of costs on those sectors, right? Important to think about. And trade exposed sectors are key in this particular piece. Is there potential resiliency? Okay. Uh, in those in those areas, to the extent that there are trade exposed sectors that I have are grouped, right? So you might imagine there in the U.S. there are like textile workers in Georgia, for instance, and you have now have trade that is going to be exposed to um, China. What happens to the textile workers that are all grouped together in the state of Georgia and Ohio or in in the United States, right? So often these industries are locally concentrated. Okay. Um, and I want to note here that economics is a tool that we can use to evaluate these distributional trade-offs, but it cannot answer this question alone. So there are deep theoretical reasons why welfare analysis is um, very tricky, just using economic criteria alone. Essentially, how do you aggregate how people feel? It's a, it's a difficult question. It's a difficult question. So we can give some suggestions and things to think about, but we can't answer it alone. I want to make a free trade analogy here. Okay. Uh, there's this very nice paper from the AER. It's called uh, China Syndrome, Local Labor Market Effects of Import Competition in the United States. So essentially, um, early 1999, early 2000s, uh, China enters the WTO. Um, tariffs and trade, China opens up. What happens to trade exposed sectors in the US? Right. This is a relative prices change story. Right. Very similar to we have large carbon policies, relative prices are going to change. Right. Uh, it's a fantastic paper, uh, really interesting. I talk about the China syndrome is actually really funny. Um, so I also do ener an energy economics class um, at Ohio University. And the China syndrome is the name of, an, of a 1979 movie with Jane Fonda about a nuclear meltdown of a reactor, okay? This came out in mid-March, 1979. What happened at the end of March, 1979? Does anybody know? The Three Mile Island nuclear disaster in the United States. So this was in the movie theater. Literally two weeks later, there was a partial reactor meltdown at Three Mile Island, um, which was fascinating. So great timing there. Uh, and if you didn't know, the other reactors at Three Mile Island were operational until just a few years ago. They just kind of took that reactor, poured some concrete in it, shut it down, kept using the other ones for, for decades. So the, that plant was still operational until 2018, I think. Yeah, so China syndrome. So I love that name. Okay, great. Uh, so let me give you some highlights. So this is just from the abstract of the paper. Uh, we analyzed the effect of rising Chinese import competition between 1990 and uh, uh, 2007 on U.S. local labor markets. So you can think of this as right competition from lower carbon imports from outside the EU or UK. Right, rising imports caused higher unemployment, uh, lower labor force participation, reduced wages in local labor markets that house import competing manufacturing industries. Right, so textile workers in in Georgia was like the main the main thing they were looking at. The in the in the textbook economic models, people just move to places where there are higher prices, right? And uh, and kind of everything kind of clears the markets eventually. It turns out that this 
paper found very long lasting negative economic consequences, right? So it didn't quite adjust nearly as fast. So transfer benefits for unemployment went up. That's maybe not surprising, but more surprising, disability claims skyrocketed, retirements skyrocketed, and healthcare costs skyrocketed, right? So you see all these things of people aren't working, people aren't employed, their life starts falling apart. They essentially can't um, uh, recover back to where they were. And this leads to lots of consequences that are beyond just unemployment, right? And so I want to kind of think about this analogy between these two things and really thinking about, you know, even though the carbon border adjustment mechanism doesn't address the largest leakage piece, it may address a very important distributional aspect that we kind of know ex post was a very big driver of um, political debates regarding concentrated costs in local areas. So I just want to highlight that analogy, and I think it's a pretty useful analogy here. Okay. Carbon leakage uh, concern from unilateral you know, common policy. We identify seven different mechanisms. Uh, fuel price effect is the largest, but we have distributional cause reasons to think that the terms of trade might also might be very important to target. There's current policy discussions on how to address this in both the EU and the UK. And uh, distributional and concentrated economic effects are also important to consider, in my view. That's not part of uh, the technical paper, but it's my, my view in terms of looking at the other literature on this. Right, thank you very much.